Hey guys, Dave from Nerdarchy, for Nerds, by Nerds, and today I'm hanging out with TL. Uh, we've just been chatting for a little while here, and she's involved in like a little bit of everything from the sounds of it. And actually, your career sounds amazingly fun. <laughs> so It really is. I've gotten very lucky. You know, so I first um, became aware of you when I seen the GM tips you and um, Satine did, and it was you guys did an excellent job. It was it was a, definitely a very fun episode to watch, and Thank I enjoyed you. you guys telling the stories about the different kids you guys had in your games and Big Dude the Pig Ninja. <laughs> Yes, that was amazing. Uh, so much so, we, you know, we had felt inspired to do a video response to that one, and, and kind of weigh in as three dads that are kind of you know gamers, and you know uh, have our kids at different areas of gaming at different levels. Matter of fact, um, Scott, who was in the video with us, his daughter is about to join us for our next game. So that, so that, so that should be a lot of fun. That's fantastic. And uh, she's like, uh, I guess she's just getting ready to head off to college. So. Oh, what a good memory that's going to be. Just that nice, like, have that last kind of hurrah with dad and the fam and the friends before you go off. College is definitely going to be, could be intense, it could be exciting, but I think the focus definitely tends to be on school and not on Dungeons and Dragons or tabletop gaming. Yeah, so so that's going to be a lot of fun. We let the fans vote, and we, like, Scott usually runs uh, our non-D&D games. So we're, like, Mythic Heroes, like, uh, Percy Jackson style with Cypher oh. System or uh, Mutants of Masterminds 3rd Edition, Marvel Meets DC, uh, Savage Rifts, and then um, Uncanon Star Wars uh, with the Fantasy Flight games. Ooh. So they're the ones, and, and the fans seem to have settled on Star Wars. I was going to say, I voted on Uncanon Star Wars, it turns out. <laughs> yeah, my son the most, mostly your that one. <laughs> Uh, I think I think we're going to see because my son was pushing for that one. I think we're going to see a, a Jedi Ewok. <laughs> <gasps> that sounds um. I love when that kind of stuff happens. That's why I was so enthralled with Pig Dude the Pig Ninja because it just seems so wacky and silly, yeah. but it's beautiful in its creativity. And when you see it in action, when somebody you know invests in becoming the Jedi Ewok, you'll have stories to tell. I'm sure for the rest of your lives, it's going to be great. The, the last session of our Star Wars game with that, my son was playing a Wookiee Jedi. And um, at, at the end, one of the things we were trying to do was there was a Ewok reservation because of all the, you know, because of when the, when Endor uh, was underneath the Death Star getting destroyed, uh, you know, Scott had decided that it basically wiped out most of the Ewoks, but there was a small number of them left and there was a reservation and we had to save them. And then, you know, and then we were trying to take them to the cloning facility to clone more Ewoks so that the species wouldn't uh, cease to exist. And, uh, <laughs> And my son wanted to wanted to add some of the Wookiee DNA so that they could be Jedi's. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's genius! That's brilliant. I love this story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, and, and that, you know, so I, I t that was like one of the days I took my my son to work with me. But speaking of work, why don't you uh, you know go over your bio real quick with everyone because you do some really cool stuff, and I didn't even realize how cool your jobs are. <laughs> Thank you. So, Dave, thank you for having me on the show. And, and hi, everybody. It's nice to meet you all. Um, I am very rarely in front of the camera, so I get very nervous and I get tongue twisted a little bit. Um, I was actually not going to do the GM tips with Satine. I've known her for a few years and I was like, hell to the no. I do not belong in front of the camera. It's not where I'm most comfortable. But she felt that um, I had a contribution to me to our gaming space and you know, as a good, you know, gaming citizen and that she wanted me to share my stories and my experiences. And, and that was really important to me since a lot of what I advocate for in my personal time is, you know, this idea of storytelling and collective madness, as I like to call it, and, and really um, engaging with as many people as possible in our gaming community and, and learning with the you know, Jedi, you know, Ewoks and these stories that we make up and tell with each other. M most of my role, actually, I would say 90% of my work in gaming is all behind the scenes. Um, I was a very many years at the Walt Disney Animation Studios when I was a wee lass and uh, ended up uh, getting into the world of contracting where I did a lot of different kinds of work all over different companies um, in Los Angeles, which is where I'm based. Um, and about a year and some change ago, got hooked up with Legendary Digital Networks, which is the home of Geek and Sundry which probably your fan base might know a lot of, about Nerdist and Amy Poehler's Smart Girls. Uh, one of my projects last year, um, 
was Project Alpha, uh, which is Legendary's uh, uh, video platform. And that's the kind of work that I do behind the scenes. So I may work in gaming and geek culture, but it really is on the business end or the enterprise end. But what that does mean is I get to handshake a lot and hug a lot and collaborate a lot and partner a lot with people who are in front of the camera in the gaming space and who are telling these stories. Um, and every now and again, a wonderful opportunity will come my way, like this with, with you, Dave, uh, or with the team, to sort of change the tables and get a little brave uh, and be in front of the camera. But yeah, I've been I've been in LA for 17 years. I've been in this space. Well, I've been a gamer for you know 38 of my 40 years of life. <laughs> I started out as a video gamer and and then went to you know tabletop you know board games and tabletop RPGs. But working in this space probably for the last oh my gosh, I don't know, maybe. 15 years, 12 to 15 years. Uh, there's a lot of us, you know, that are behind the scenes that want to collaborate and partner with folks like you that are in front of the cameras and, and sharing your stories with the world. So it's been a great privilege. Um, and we do, it's a, been a lot of fun to work on a lot of great projects that, uh, that are coming out. We got a lot of secret stuff coming out soon here from Geek and Sundry. So keep your eyes open for that. Um, but yeah, that's the, that's the kind of work I do behind the scenes. Now, I actually seen you in front of the camera as well because you played in Satine's Monster High game. Yes. Well, it's not really Monster High, but I, it, it makes me think of Monster High. My daughter used to be really into that. Monster High, I've, I've actually played Monster High. So my first foray into gaming in the digital space, other than say like Roll20 with my buddies, when our, you know, our local group was people were moving, you know, around the country, um, was about a year and a half ago with a gamer named Arthur, who's actually in your guys' neck of the woods, so I can't wait to hook you guys up. Uh, he goes by the handle AP Gaming Reel on Twitter and on Twitch. And he's very big into giving as many voices the space uh, as possible to share and communicate about gaming uh, and talk about gaming and play. And I'd never done this before. You know, I'm straight up like, you know, pencil and paper, tabletop, d and -er, dungeon master. Like, this is what I do. I've never done this stuff in front of the camera. And I was super nervous. And it was wonderful. We played Spears of the Dawn. Uh, and then after that, I ended up playing One Shot Monster High and playing a One Shot in Masks. Um, and again, because of knowing Satine and, and our business collaborations, was invited to play the Tiefling Warlock character of the high school Savage Nation for Maze Arcana, which was a lot, a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, so there are times where I feel like I'm kind of an eclipse because she sometimes pops out on camera and sometimes, she, most of the time, I'm, de I'm definitely not. So uh, thank you for, uh, for mentioning it. That was a lot of fun and I appreciate you guys supporting that and watching that. Uh, yeah, that was that was a great game. I am two thirds of the way through. Uh, when I went to watch the third the third episode, uh, Twitch was being a butt, and I, I rarely get to watch that stuff live. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know so, a lot of our we hear that as well with uh, like the Geek Century fans of uh, Critical Role. We hear that a lot. Like we can't really watch it live, which was uh, amazing to me to hear. Not just we can't watch it live, you know, just because you know work life, whether you're a Pacific, you know, Standard Time person, but people from around the world were watching this content and the show. So uh, even though I've been in the space for you know 12 to 15 years, there are some things that I learn, you know, just working here, especially at LDN, that are just like they blow me away as I get to understand more of the gaming community and and also very specific aspects of the gaming community. You know, the Twitch gaming community is one aspect and the tabletop gaming community is another or non D&D, &D, right? And then the D&D &D streaming community, like, they, you know, uh, WOTC just had their stream of Annihilation this past Friday and Saturday um, with a lot of the, some of the folks you may know, I know that were participating. Um, there, there are now celebrity D and D, right? Uh, channels popping up that are being supported by Wizards of the Coast uh, or supported by Twitch. Um, so it's just a lot of or Riot Games, which their biggest business is, you know, esports e and gaming, and and they're huge on Twitch for all their tournaments. They even sold out the LA, um, the Staples Center, which is where you know our our teams play. The, the Lakers play there and, and the and the Clippers play there. Like, this is outstanding to me. So the, I'm always learning about these new amazing things in, in specially specific subsections of our gaming community that are just, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's brilliant and just mind boggling how, you know, when I was started, I was, I was definitely, I'll get a little real for a second, probably the only Puerto Rican in the projects of the Bronx and in the Bahia of Manhattan. 
playing like video games or D&D or like board games is definitely not a thing that my family had done when I was growing up. And it's not a thing that other of my peers in elementary school or middle school or high school were doing. So I was straight up that nerd. And now in 2017, I'm like, I'm working in the gaming geek culture space, I'm making very um, amazing products and, and participating participating in some fantastic, you know, I get to do some influential decision making and on, that impacts the kinds of things that Legendary is going to do in the future. And I'm going, dude, I, just, I remember when I was like, does anybody want to play D&D with me? <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's amazing to see uh, this sort of, it, it, especially in this last like 10 years, it's just been amazing, the business space, or that people will say, I'm done with traditional sort of work, I'm going to step into the role of a gaming entrepreneur. And I'm going to make my way that way, uh, like you've done and Satine has done. And that's just, that to me is like, wow, at first it's brave, but it's also intensely curious. I want to ask so many questions to people whose life is professional gaming. I think that's, I would never know, I would not have thought that was a thing. And it wasn't, not when I was even in high school, in the 90s, so so long ago. <laughs> you know, honestly, I kind of, I kind of fell into this because, well, one, I've, al I've, I've always been, you know, a gamer and a nerd, but I've always, like, a closet nerd, you know, so, like, I, in high school, I would hang out with all the metalheads, and I was in that scene, and then, like, you know, we would talk in code when we are talking about, exactly, we would talk in code when we are talking about D&D, &D and we would call it rocking out, you know, or <laughs> it wouldn't get talked about at, at school at all, and, you know, over the years, I started, um, messing around with like network marketing and internet marketing and learning how to do things online and drive traffic. And my mentor who happened to be a good friend of mine is like, you should be, you should do Dungeons and Dragons. You, you should do that online. That should be your thing. You're, you are a dungeon master. And I'm like, I don't think there's anything in there. You know, I don't think I can feed my kids, kids with that at all. Yeah. 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 I mean, that, that would be, it seems super counterintuitive. It absolutely does. And then my brother is like, hey, let's start this thing up, and I want to do indie board games. I'm like, I like board games, but I'm not a board game guy, like, you know, the, the way he is, and even my partner Ted is. So I was like, well, let's take a look around and see, you know, and see what's out there. And we started putting out no atwell or counter counter monkey. And and I'm like, oh, well, I guess this really is a thing. And we just started like kind of going generic and talking about you know role-playing games and D&D &D and whatever and then fifth edition launched and we just we really just started talking about the right thing at the right time and we kind of like exploded from there I mean it's convenient that we actually like this version of the game too. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah I wouldn't I would have never thought that thought to do this and it was like my brother who's actually not a part of nerdarchy anymore has gone off to do art stuff and my friend who's not even a gamer kind of pushed us into, you know, pushed me into doing this thing. And, you know, the, you're on episode number 55 of these live chats and they've, you know, since we started them and, uh, you know, the whole thing has blown me away. Uh, Kyle had a question for you. Um, he's like hearing about all the cool stuff and you're doing contributions, responsibilities. Uh, he's curious what your job title is. Sure. My current job title at Legendary Digital Networks is Enterprise senior or senior enterprise project manager senior enterprise project manager and what that is is uh, a project manager is someone that might do and sort of encapsulate a project and deliver help deliver a product and the enterprise level i work across all of the business units here at legendary digital uh, and help them deliver their projects and products or at the very least i must be in tune with what they're doing even if i'm not their direct uh, project manager so ldn actually has in um, their structure is a very uh, productized and productized structure um, and some some they're very operationalized teams you know, as you can imagine they have a marketing team and a sales team have a post-production team uh, and those are very operational teams uh, but some of the things that we do put out like shows or uh, products based on the shows you know some people love the we just launched some vast pins or bizarre state pins like even those little things would be considered projects uh, because the intent is to deliver something and then it's done so at scale, an enterprise project manager, that's what I would do. I would, instead of doing one, I do many, 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 um, and get to have my hand in a lot of the different things that happen across the three brands at Legendary, which is the Geek and Sundry stuff, the Nerder stuff, and the, and the Smart Girl stuff. So I get to know all the secrets all across the board, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> do you ever mix them up? <laughs> no, you know, I, uh, I, I did when I first started here. Um, 
and and I learned really quickly. Like even though Nerdist and Geek and Sundry kind of play in very similar spaces, Geek and Sundry is very much I feel like the gaming community space, where Nerdist is very much the uh, thoughtful, inquisitive, provocative. In geek culture type of space. You know, they write a lot of great articles about the stuff that is happening in our world that influences, I would say, geek culture, whereas Geek and Sundry would write more about the stuff that is happening in the gaming world. So, so like, you know, si sisters, just a different sides of, of you know, focusing. So I did for a while, like, who, what? Who's, as a matter of fact, the other day at a meeting, I was like, because science has a Ouija board pin, and they were like, mm, TL, I'm sure because science is not into Ouija boards, and I was like, that's correct. It's bizarre states. It's a very different thing. So, yeah, because science and Ouija boards were there. Although now I should think, of, hey, Kyle Hill, <laughs> let's make a Because Science episode about Ouija boards, which would be ridiculous. Oh, that would be great. That's Surprise great. lightsaber. <laughs> yes. <sir. laughs> so, that question actually came from intern Kyle. And uh, now he says, hey, Dave, I'm going to do that at Nerdarchy. <laughs> I'm like, well, what are you going to do? We with should the talk. <laughs> After 15 minutes of your day, what are you going to do with the rest of it? <laughs> we should talk. I think you can have a lot of, you know, we do, other than just doing projects, we plan. There's a lot of road mapping, a lot of portfolio. So being an enterprise project manager does mean I'm kind of responsible for the portfolio of projects that are going on here at Legendary at scale. And, uh, and even if we're not, doing a particular project right now because the legendary is actually really small there are only about a hundred brilliant brains here um you kind of have to pick and choose the initiatives that you want to go after uh we have a roadmap of stuff that we what's our future look like and uh, i think any business any small business big business entrepreneur business can benefit from that. i'm gonna stop talking about business because it's not <laughs> worth the problem but because that's my life for like you know yeah. Well, you know, actually, <laughs> you make it exciting. Uh, it's what, it's what you're talking about. We in in this space, it it's very easy. <laughs> when you're like, hey, so I'm collaborating with Critical Role, or I'm collaborating with Because Science, and it's like, come on, you know, we get to go to E3, and, you know, people talk about, okay, it's very serious business. We're going to Comic Con. And I'm like, it's Comic Con. But it is. It's very serious business. We want to make sure that, you know, that the content is right and the community is heard and the stuff that the, the, the teams are, you know, putting their effort towards are things that are going to hit, you know, what our audience is. So there is a lot of business decision making and it, uh, coupled with the, you know, creative in the back end. I just happen to be much more in the business side than the creative side. I, I feel like uh, Nerdarchy has a roadmap like that, but it looks a lot like the questions uh, uh, conspiracy theory board. <laughs> uh, so that's, uh, that's what ours looks like too. Keep nice. One quick thing from uh, Comic Book University, then I want to ask you about the game you just ran. Tomorrow. There's something called Comic Book University. What is that? The, um. A, a small and upcoming YouTube channel. He's got really good content over there about comic books. He's got a ton of content out there. Um, so we are always pointing people in his direction. He's actually running tomorrow. He will be running a Marvel phase rip game for us. So that uh, sounds interesting. I would like to. Yeah. See yeah. Oh my goodness. We're in, I, I do we're have in, one thing for comic book university this summer. I actually made a, uh, a uh, goal for myself to read one between one and three series of comic books because uh, maybe surprisingly, even though I work in this space, I'm I have very specific sort of geek tastes. Um, I'm a board gamer, I'm a video gamer, or a tabletop gamer. I don't necessarily step into the world of like anime or um, cosplay, and especially not comic books. But I work with amazing like comic book experts like Jody Hauser is here who's nominated for an Eisner award and, and they're gonna be give they do those awards at comic you know Comic Con San Diego Comic Con. And I'm like, how am I not I need to you know, like absorb what is happening. You know, Talison Jaffe, uh, Hector Navarro, these are people who are here. Brian Compton, who's a behind the scenes guy like me, who's an absolute comic expert. You see them talking about comic books. So I was like, I'm going to do this. So I picked up three series Star Trek Waypoint, because Geordi's captain of the Enterprise and Data has cloned himself into multiple holograms and is now the Enterprise brain. Um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, they've always been near and dear to my heart as a New Yorker, but they have a, oh, nice, <laughs> but they have a, um, they have a series coming out called Dimension X, which I learned about in Free Comic Book Day, and then Bitch Planet, which is not safe for work, but it's absolutely fantastic and very provocative, and I'm loving it so far. I bought the trade. And I'm, I'm learning about this by, I wanted to have one 
intelligent question to ask the comic book experts in-house. I feel like I was not making the most of these opportunities that I have here to be able to talk about you know, this particular fandom. So Comic Book University, I will probably be tuning in uh, to your YouTube channel <laughs> to, oh, get, yeah. to get more smarter. It's a fantastic resource, and he does uh, different heroes in a, in about a minute. It's called this is the series, so you could like just totally like junk food out on yeah, them. Yeah, 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 that would be great. Do they have a question? I might have missed it because there, there was a bit you of a bit actually, lag. Yeah, yeah, you kind of actually cover it because he's like, all right, enough pussyfooting around uh, around the subject. TL, Marvel, or DC, and I'm like, well, <laughs> they're they're not really superheroes at all. <laughs> yeah, that's a good. That's good. So good question. So here's the thing. Um, I don't do comic books, right? So that's really hard. And the last few movies, say, that I've watched on both ends, I watched um, the X-Men Apocalypse. And I was like, am I Sorry. <laughs> confused about what's happening here? Are they in ancient Egypt? What is this? I'm not quite sure what's going on. And then, of course, I've seen uh, you know, BVS. And I was like, ah, these are both not so good. I don't quite know. You know, I, I liked the Christian Bale Dark Knight, but I'm a huge fan of, I actually saw Michael Keaton's Batman, you know, in the movies, because that was around my time. And I loved it. He's, I sort of kind of have a candle for him as Batman. But I'm like, if, let me get through the summer. How about this comic book universe? Let me get through the summer and I will let you know. Because right now I can't say that I've got, I mean, I know about it, but I'm not a comic book person. I can't really choose. And could also, I, could I choose Final Fantasy? But that's <laughs> not an option. Also, wasn't one of your buddies in Guardians of the Galaxy too? One of my buddies was in Guardians of the Galaxy. Who is it? Who is it? Who is it? Um, uh, Mirian. Uh, she's she's in. Um, she plays for with Maze Arcana. Um, I can't think of her name. She was she was Robo Bride number three. I oh think. my goodness, there are so many. That's another thing that happens, by the way, and I, and I hope you guys don't mind me talking so much about the sort of work that I do here. That's really you know, kind of a top of frame because I'm actually in the office right now in the conference room. But um, in Justice 2, like all of the voices, the, the amazing people from Critical Role are in that, in that video game. And I'm like, this is great. I was walking by one day and they were like, I hear Supergirl. I'm like, that sounds like Laura. Is it? Oh my gosh. Uh, and those are a lot of fun. And I actually end up uh, asking silly questions like, how many like damage noise does you, do you have to make <laughs> to, to record like separate? You know, and, yeah, yeah, like all these kinds of weird separate noises. And they're like, yeah, that's the funniest part of it. So that's like part of their voiceover repertoire to so know how to do that stuff. And then, you know, friends play Overwatch, which is a super popular game. Um, and, uh, uh, and like MMO, I think, right? So lots of people, multiplayer game. And uh, Matt Mercer is the voice of one of like the cowboy characters. <laughs> and somebody was playing just clips of that character's one-liners. And it was like, that is straight up like Southern Matt. <laughs> it's so weird yeah. to hear like, I work with you as a professional. And I'm starting to understand their work outside of like Geek and Sundry. And I'm like, this is amazing. It's so great. Or just stuff you wouldn't know. Like Taliesin is a comic book genius uh, and artist um, and and that's just stuff and then uh, some of you might know Sam and he does a lot of voiceover work and that that guy is like in person one of the funniest people I have met he's really really funny so the but name it's all I was of that like that sorry go ahead Mylin Sarley. I'm oh, I didn't know Mylin was in Guardians of the Galaxy too. That's and fantastic. So Mylin, she plays the character. She's the uh, the actress of all the purple hair, um, and a super super sweet but super brilliant business young lady. Like talking with her, it's the kind of thing that I love. Is that I think you see people on camera and they're like, they're great. And I want to send you presents and I want to do this fan art. But if you ever get a chance to talk to them about like, let's talk about business and how this works. Oh my gosh, it's like a whole other level, man. These people are fantastic. They know their stuff, they know their business, they know their audience, they know what they're trying to do, they know what they want to communicate, and they work really hard to make sure that they're delivering, you know, to the community the sort of I think like the intent that's in their hearts. Like I would like, you know, one thing that I've heard Matt say a lot is, you know, uh, rising waters helped all ships and that gaming storytelling is about building community uh, at, of, with strangers, but also with family kind of thing. And, and when you get to talk with those folks on, on, about, uh, on that kind of level, why are we doing this? And 
you know, what drives you, it, it's, I'd like, we could sit here talking forever. It's really outstanding and particularly grateful to be, you know, working in a space like this, especially <laughs> like, like you were saying before, you can do this as a job. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. When people ask, you know, what's the best part? It's always this the answer is always the same. It's the people. Like, it's, yeah. Whether it's new people that you meet and friends you get connected with or the fans and, and they actually answered the question while I was looking it up in the chat. Um, so, and someone also asked the question of someone, but you have a name, um, true mate. Uh, do you prefer to play or DM? And then let's get into your game that you, you ran this weekend. <sighs> I prefer to DM. That one I do have a direct response for. Um, I played for a really long time, um, and then in college was asked to DM. Uh, some of you may know Werewolf the Apocalypse, which is a white wolf brand. They also do Vampire the Masquerade, which I think probably has taken up a lot more of the talk about white wolf games than, say, Werewolf, because they have an amazing LARP that is still like internationally known um, and like wins awards and things. So I started there and loved it and um i've not played a lot of werewolf the apocalypse since college but uh it was just great i just i enjoyed i i found that i liked being part of the story in a way that was much more holistic and robust than just playing sort of like a singular character experience but i played up for a lot i played a bard necromancer those are my favorite types of classes to play um, and then just decided that I'm going to DM. And specifically, my, I would say my specialty is in DMing one shots. But just the nature of schedule and work. And you, you know, when I was younger, I have we could spend lots of times campaigning. But as I've grown older, and my friends have grown older, and they have other you know, family obligations or professional obligations, we just don't have that time to do sort of camp, epic campaigns. So I've become really, really awesome at being able to get in, you know, figure out how to how to make one shots engaging and interesting. Uh, and then Dave, if you don't mind me just rolling into the one shot that I did this Saturday was Tomb of Horrors, which is uh, Wizards of the Coast, Dungeons and Dragons. They released their tales from the yawning, yawning portal. I can't remember saying this, a yawning portal. Um, and, uh, and inside is all of these different sort of amazing you know, dungeons that are from, from the days of Gygax. And Tomb of Horrors has a reputation for being one of the most deadly dungeons there is. Uh, I have to say, after playing with uh, one, two, five, four, five level 14 characters, Tomb of Horrors, vanilla, has a lot more bark than bite. I only killed one person twice, and the second death was voluntary. <laughs> so we had a really good time. DMing a trap puzzle uh, module is very different than DMing a story, even a one-shot story module. Um, and Tomb of Horror specifically was requesting that DMs don't help the players. Like part of Tomb of Horrors and the love of Tomb of Horrors is you have to sort it out yourself. And the DM is really just rolling how, you know, you know to hit for, for traps and damage and stuff like that. And if they run into the occasional, you know, uh, monster uh, in the dungeon, but it's like 85% traps and puzzles and 15% like monster. Yeah, so um I've played Tomb of Horrors once in AD and D and it was probably going on you know 20 ish some years ago and and then like i would tell the I've, you know, I've told these guys about what i remember from that experience they're like dave you made it to the entryway <laughs> <laughs> mike my team spent two hours real time like where's the door which one do we go in so playing i would say playing it was especially because we set the right tone like we planned for about two months and i was telling the players very regularly this is not a hack and slash this is not a hack and slash so this will not work for you if you are not interested in, you know, going through riddles and sorting through puzzles and that your character may die. Um, I think one of the things was, you know, definitely 14th level I felt was def it's too high. And after talking with friends, sort of sat down to the retrospective of the game, which is what I like to do is I know, you know, one shots, what works and what can I do next time. And I think we all came to this consensus that um, the dungeon itself sort of probably has lost a lot of teeth since your AD and D days. I mean, there's hardly, I don't think there's any you know, save, like no, no save and then just death. Um, and I might want to sort of meld the two a little bit more when it comes to the deadliness of the AD and D tumor horrors and the little bit more um, 
uh, menacing, but not as deadly, you know, 5E to Mahar. So we were saying probably level 10, level 8 to 10 probably, and then really just amp up the, you know, have them, you know, save for, versus death, like have that be a thing. Um, and just have, have really get that ridiculous with 5e to Mahars, I would say. One thing that we did do differently, which the team did kind of like, was I had, had a house rule of we're going to use madness. And so if you were actively doing something in the Tomb of Horrors, you were fine. But if you were just kind of, you know, putzing around the Tomb of Horrors, not really doing anything, the sort of, you know, menacing aspect of the tomb might start to, you know, mess with your mind a little bit and, we're getting progressively harder to make uh, saves, you know, versus like uh, madness as the as the as you go deeper and deeper and deeper into the tomb. People really like that. One of the characters' favorite saves is started attacking their friends, and that was like the most action we had. <laughs> if you see me like laughing or chuckling or looking off to the side, it's because I have the chat up over here. Uh, in while I listen in to you, so um, I, you know, I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking about while I was in the shower earlier that I want to do a deadliest monsters. Uh, for D and D, because they there is no save or suck anymore. They got rid of it, but there is like save twice or suck or uh, miss by miss by five, and something really bad happens. Uh, and I was like, well, what happens if you introduce miss by ten and something really bad? Happens? <laughs> I want I want to do a book of monsters and just play with like uh, with like just the deadlier aspects of five E and maybe tweak little things and, and see what we can come up with. The, the last uh, one shot that I did before this Tomb of Hearts, which I do recommend, I just think, you know, amp up the deadliness and lower the level. Because I was reading the recommended level was 10 to 14, and I tend to err on the side of caution. So I asked my team, you know, let's do 14 and then we can back it out later on next time. You know, let's start really high and back it out from there. Um, and that was a bit too easy. So I would actually go, I would not, you know, the interwebs had steered me wrong this time. I'd even heard Chris Perkins had recommended 10 to 14. I would say, I would say eight to 10, honestly. Uh, and then amp up the the deadliness. But we did a level twenty one shot from uh, Dan Coleman. He does Dungeons on Demand, so it's RPG.com Dungeons on Demand. His stuff is amazing. I love reading other people's modules. So the one shots that I run are are ninety nine percent of the time modules that I buy uh, from you know uh, DriveThroughRPG.com. And uh, this one was called uh, Ceiling Fate, and uh, it has a Trask. And it was so much fun. Of I killed four of six people. Like when I put calls out for my one shots, um, I don't even name the game. I just say, you know, D and D five E one shot TPK bitches, and people are like, yes, I'm in. <laughs> Because I'm like, this is the intent is that like I when I was talking in GM tips, I'm like, the intent is we're really just gonna have at it. I'm not gonna pull any punches. I roll out on the table in front of you. Uh, you roll out, right? There's no secret rolls here. If I hit and I crit, one time I was playing that this particular module, and they're like, oh, you, you're at disadvantage, and I'm like, great, I roll twice, two twenties. So I'm like, you gotta oh. be kidding me. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. like Instagram that or something. That's <laughs> <laughs> so those are the fun stories. Uh, so yeah, so that uh, level twenty was a lot, a lot of fun. And I played previous um, Dan Coleman modules for like eleven. So he actually now has from one to twenty. Um, so I highly recommend looking at his stuff because they're pretty good. And 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 a shout out to BJ Hensley. She's got modules and one shots that are for children. So you know, we talk a lot about D and D, and I I do mostly play with adults. When I get out to my you know FLGS. Uh, it's a mixed group of people, but usually my personal time is with adults. And so I tend towards the Dan Coleman stuff. Um, and then now BJ Hensley has the stuff for, for kids. So definitely check them both. I'm just both sides of the scale with different perspectives. And the one in the middle, I think his name is Grant. Let's say, I can't remember his last, how to pronounce his last name. It starts with an H. He's got this kind of funky, like one shots. One's called like, you're a bear, <laughs> some kind of bear. And you're trying to get the honey. And I was like, that I think, my friends would love to play as much as their kids would love to play. <laughs> I'm, I'm circling BJ now. I, I want to get her on one of the live chats if she's available. It, it's a weird time for a lot of people too, because I, 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 one of my th goals with it is like, I want to do it when my family's not around. So I try and, I try and constrain as much as my work as I can. Uh, Cause I'm like, well, if I'm going to quit my job and be home, I might as well see them as opposed to when I didn't see them before. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's very nice of you. 
<laughs> yeah, but I find that this type side has worked out really well for us getting people on and um, and people watching internationally as well as in the States. So that's been good. Speaking of which, guys, if you want to bust out the roll call, go for it. And uh, we'll keep talking and we'll jump back in the chat for that in a moment. What does that mean, bust out the roll call? Oh, so uh, basically every day at some point, I ask them to, to put in the chat where they're from and we just... Uh, <gasps> where are they from? That's where we're going to find out. There's always a little bit of a delay. Um, so I'm originally from New York City. Well, we're sitting, down Bronx. I know <laughs> we're talking about that, right? You know, right yeah. up the turnpike from us in New Jersey. Yeah, yeah. I used to have an accent, and I've worked really hard, and I don't now. I feel like I have a California accent. To of course, the dismay of my family still is it. You sound like you're from LA. <laughs> you so, but I've the, been here for 17 years in LA. The first one to actually kick it off was Ross from Germany. Oh, uh, I've been there one time. Cool. I've been to Heidelberg. I Hello, have, Germany. I, I, the only place I've been out of the States now is Mexico and Costa Rica. I went there, too. went to Ensenada, Mexico. We, I almost got stuck there, too. Um, <laughs> but we were there for a Comic-Con cruise, and we, we got off the ship and then we, in uh, Cozumel and then uh, took, took a ferry to the mainland to meet up with actually a friend of my wife that had moved down there. And we literally caught the last ferry back uh, to Cozumel. Uh, before the ship was going to leave, it was, we were the, literally the last ones on the boat. You said yeah. it was a Comic Con ship? Comic Con cruise, yep. Well, I think I've heard of these before. There's only like one a year, right? No, this is the first one that's ever actually. There's comic cosplay cruises and there's a bunch of different things. Okay. okay but okay. this was actually um, a full, uh, was it three days or four days uh, cruise? That just sounds like fun. From Tampa to Cozumel and back. And, you know, there was panels from The Walking Dead. Uh, the Galaxy. What? I'm learning all the new things. This sounds John amazing. Andrews is uh, Brian Stillman, and, and uh, he's doing art. He's, he did a documentary called Plastic Galaxy, as well as he's work currently working on the art of D and D, Eye of the Beholder. Uh, and that's so, definitely <laughs> right up my alley. <laughs> yeah, we actually gave away a cabin. Like somehow we finagled that made a pact, a warlock pact of our own. And uh, we ended up in a cabin and gave it away to the fans. It kind of screwed us though. Like, what do we do now for giveaways? <laughs> Here's a poor game. <laughs> We're up here. <laughs> the rest yeah. of y'all get this. Pretty much. We got Rob in Seattle. Uh, hey, Seattle. Staff writer Scott is in Philly. We got intern Kyle is in Jersey. East coast, east coast. Beast Coast, yeah, yeah, yeah. We got Regilio in Utah, Fort Lauderdale. Uh, can't talk. Fort Lauderdale in the house with Andrew. We got Sweden with uh, Lincoln. We got Sweet. Daniel. In, you, I'm so that's amazing. Daniel in Norway, <laughs> they're still coming. Uh, we got Satori in Sacramento. Hello, watching international people. I hope you. I know uh, it's it's the all, cool thing. All my hugs to you guys over there in Europe, and the things are difficult. It's so wonderful that there are so many gamers across the world tuning in. This is amazing. We're everywhere. Uh, Arkansas with Lehman, AJ Kinney in Washington. Uh, what do we got here? Uh, greetings from Luxembourg. We got Salt Lake City, <sighs> Utah from Jacob. Poisons in Kuwait. Yeah. We got Calamar in DC. Rob's Cleaning Service in Oregon. True Mate in Wales. Uh, I love it. I love it. This is This is the thing. And yes. you said earlier, what makes it, what's the thing that makes working in this space amazing is the people. But what's the thing that makes just being in this space amazing is the people. It really yes. is just, a, um, when I grew up in New York City, is literally, I can count on my hand the number of, you know, nerds, like Latin nerds, uh, you know, in the projects in New York City, it was like just one. And we didn't reach out to find each other. And what I've loved to see is how we've evolved as a gaming space and as good gaming citizens, you know, in these last few decades, that there, we're from all over, right? From all walks of life. There are women my age, right? I'm 40. Uh, there are men. There are people who are all kinds of, you know, abilities, or physical abilities, or disabilities, all ages, all sizes, all types, all everything, um, and, and across all kinds of fandoms. And just that this is what makes this exactly hearing that roll call it's like i'm gonna tear up because that's what makes this so yes. special and so unique is that we are we're a legion right we are everywhere and when we do well together and for each other we do really really well and i'm just like you know there is a dark side of the force and 
you know, when I was watching Stream of Annihilation, uh, Stream of Annihilation this past weekend and looking in the Twitch chat, you know, there's some unfortunate things that I saw happening and those things kind of hurt my heart because I know that's not us and I know that's not representational of good geek citizens. When we do well and when we, you know, the, the, love this space like we do just for games and what it is it's just that people are from all over the world all over our, my country right here it makes me so proud to be part of this space so even before we started chatting david i'm saying i identify as gamer and geek before i identify as female and human and latino and like new yorker or los angelino right like this has been my identity since as far as i know and it makes me so i get I'm getting like chills just hearing all the names where people are coming from know where you guys are I love seeing that um, and I love that that community that stretches far and wide but still feels very often so close and intimate well and that's the thing too like you know 12 o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon we're we, for for us on the East Coast we've been rocking right around 50 ish people uh, we still we, and there's still the, the, the roll call is still going like Iron Ash is in St. Paul we got Ada in Norway Vizard in South Jersey, and it's so crazy. Like you'll, I'll see one, well, I'll see like a Norway or something, and it'll come up again. I'm like, oh, did they just retype it? And I'm like, no, there's actually two. There's, a, there's more that that's great for. So uh, one of the one of the amazing projects that I got to do here, this might actually fall in your wheelhouse, and probably your fans know, was International Tabletop Day for Geek and Sundry. That was my project, uh, and a project in the, it was a production. It was a live stream. But the lead up to, uh, right, and the encapsulation of it, we ran as a project. Um, so that's one of those things that intern, <laughs> uh, you, you could do, right? That's that's an, that's an option is uh, to be able to be a project manager for uh, a live stream. And the International Tabletop Day, we were able to uh, pull the map of where everybody's from. And I was just like, you're kidding me. I mean, like seven continents all over the world. And we see like one pip in like Russia. We're like, yes, Russia. <laughs> it was just, I, I get the sense that. The chat has that, been like the most spread out across the world. Uh, right. I, I get the sense that, it, and it makes me tear up a bit. I get the sense that, now I'm going to start crying, that I am not alone. And this is my fandom. And these are the people that I love. And this is the, the space that I choose to be in, that I choose to make my work in, that I choose to support other creative people in. And when I see and hear people from all over the world chiming in, that little you know girl who was the only nerd in her projects in the Bronx and in, in the Bahia of Manhattan is like, I feel like I could look in the past and go, that you, your people are here. Your, these are your people and we are here for you. And and when we do that for each other and with each other, when we use our powers, you know, for the light side of the force, it is, I think, an astoundingly touching, uh, beautiful thing that, that I can say gamers as a community are beautiful. Gamers as a community are full of heart and full of support and full of love. Because while there may be bad eggs, which there are everywhere, I still know, I know for a fact that the good citizen gamers that, that I know and that I'm a part of, that we are widespread across the world. And that when we continue to have these outlets for each other, like Dave, thank you for being a space for people to come talk and share and allowing me to talk and share. Like the more we do this, the more we make those touch points, which I think is is why I love gaming in the first place, right? My favorite part about gaming is I sit around a table with a bunch of people who are, who love what I love and we're gonna, and we look at each other and we're like, we're gonna engage in collective madness right now. Let's have at it. Let's talk with funny accents. Let's tell a silly story. Let's, let's, let's make pig do the pig ninja something that is real. And that, that happens only because of, you know, how we, we sort of, how we kind of handshake with each other, you know, in that unspoken way and go, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to roll some dice and we're going to be creative, silly, definitely super you know, cool people. It's a good time to be a nerd, you know, like, it sure uh, is. It sure you know, is. With the internet, we're able to connect with everybody. And then, like, yes. because uh, Nurek is a whole, we're a little bit older. So we like to tell those stories about, you know, how, how much easier you kids have it nowadays and get off my lawn. But, uh, <laughs> It is really cool. Uh, real quick, uh, too, guys, I want to remind you that we still have the GoFundMe going on. If you guys can support us, we appreciate it. Those have, who have, we really do appreciate you guys 
uh, you know, without you guys, it would not be possible. And if you've already given or you can't give, just share it out to your social media for us. We really appreciate it. Um, I was talking to TL beforehand, and it sounds like we're going to be, be able to meet a whole lot of other folks out while we're out there. So, the you know, the more money we can raise, the longer we can stay out there, the more we connect with fans that are already out there, and the more we're going to be able to meet other people and have these opportunities to bring you guys more cool content at the end of the day. So you, you're helping us build this and we really appreciate you guys. I love how you just said that right now because it sounds so much like at the end of the day. I love it. I love it. It's what it is. It's about, it's about supporting people. I'm not saying everyone go out and get a Twitch show and everyone go out and get a YouTube show, but if you can support, um, folks that are doing that and, and our standard bearers, then and do. Um, and that's that's what I do. I mean, I, I try to support financially where I can in different venues, um, but I also try to collaborate like this. I try to use my privilege as a professional in the gaming space and the geek culture space to help other people you know, see, and see where I can. It's really important to me to do that because it is. At the end of the day, is like, gamers and geeks supporting other gamers and geeks so that you can continue to be that standard bearer. And not everyone has to do it. I don't have a Twitch channel, even though I've been invited around and I play on different games now. It's not something I, do, I think that may be in my future, but I want to support those folks who are, you know, carrying that banner out on the field for us. And then I think that's super important to, to, to be able to share. And thank you for sharing that you have a GoFundMe. Um, I find you on, on YouTube and I found you on Twitter. I don't know where else to find you, but just let me know. I'll find you everywhere. <laughs> we are everywhere. Facebook, pretty much. If you just search Nerdarchy, we start popping up places. Excellent. Uh, and, so, and that was really cool too. Like uh, even from like, uh, you know, the internet marketing stand, standpoint, what I started from is like Nerdarchy didn't really exist. And now if I go and look at uh, different statistics, I can see how, how often that, that term now gets searched. And I'm like, wow, we did that. You know, you guys did that. You made an imprint. You made an impression. In this big, vast world, you're there. You exist. You're, you're a voice. And people are listening. And, and, and people are, are reaching out clearly, obviously, from all over the world. And we, you know, we've gotten the opportunity to meet people and, and hear great stories. And like, I literally, there was one Facebook message that I had gotten the one time and I handed it to my wife and she read it and she started crying because, you know, someone had said how they, they, they had, um, they had lost someone close to them. They had commit, committed suicide. And since that happened, that person wasn't really be able to able to go out into, out, out into public and society and anxiety. And, and, you know, to hear them go, well, you know, Nerdarchy videos for the past year have gotten me through and, you know, and has helped me. And we, like, didn't think anything like that when we started out. And we've probably gotten, we probably get, like, one of those a year, like, like where you've, like, profoundly impacted someone's life that you don't even know. And you know, I'm not a particularly emotional person, but even that gets me. I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe it. I'm just an idiot rolling funny shaped dice and talking about make, make believe stuff. But, but being authentically you, Dave, and your team, I think that is a large part of what resonates, like that authenticity and that sincerity as gamers. And I feel like when we are our best gaming selves, we have that kind of profound impact and it's just games, right? I keep thinking it's just games, but it, there is game like I feel like games is is that sort of community storytelling that uh, was so a big part of the human experience as humans were becoming humans and and and, and sitting around and talking to each other. Uh, you know this this game and when we reach that greatest good of what gamers are and good gaming citizens are it's that you 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 tell stories that touch somebody's heart and make them have, you know, help them have a day that is just better than it was a minute ago. Um, and, you know, when I've experienced tragedy in my life, usually the first people that I go talk to and that I depend on or that reach out to support before I'm even ready to ask for support are my gaming friends. And that's when we, I feel like, are our best selves. And I know we get a, you know, gamers, and we get a bad rap for a lot of stuff. I totally get it, understand, and we're not all perfect. Our community is not all perfect. But I feel like um, I prefer to focus more on the good that we do 
and the good that we spread. And I think that is really key for me. And what I think is the most beautiful about the people here is that, you know, from, I feel like I can make, connect the sort of, you know, positive energy thread from Norway and Jersey and LA and Luxembourg and Sweden and Utah, you know, and, and Arkansas, and that we have now connected in this way even just by virtue and you're sort of our bridge for that. And I think that's super important. People, you know, support each other in this way. We make these connections and that you have that profound impact. Or we just have fun. That's also okay. I love having fun in my day. I get through a day and I can laugh once or twice or more than once or twice, hopefully. But yeah, absolutely. And then there may be a time where I need you. I need you, fellow gamers. I need your good, positive energy, and I need your beautiful souls um, as part of this community to get me through. And and that I know that you're there, even if I've never met you before, is pretty profound for me as a, as a gamer at all these almost 40 years of my life. I just kind of had an epiphany while we were talking. And, and uh, you know, it just occurred to me how much more important tabletop gaming is whether it's board games or or role playing games we connected we've become so disconnected with each other yes. and it's one of the few things that forces us to come together in small groups and interact with each other yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely i think it's again the, the point of the group storytelling is key but i think that exposure to what is other than yourself is going to be i think critical as you know, the different countries of this world continue to evolve into what they're going to become. And how can we use our method of storytelling and connection, which is gaming, uh, in order to do that? And I don't, it doesn't go well in some spaces, right? In the video game space, I've seen some very unfortunate statistics recently put out by Xbox, you know, and again, in our uh, digital sharing spaces, especially our chats where people say some, you know, very negative things and disparaging things and like, oh man, it hurts my heart because I know that's not what we are and I know that's not the, the best of what we can do. Um, but it's going to become key uh, to be able to, and I, and I think actually I know we're getting close to you know, where, where your end of your show is, but one of the things that I would encourage, um, I, I do this myself and I'm going to think of is where else can I go find other people in other games? And I want to expose myself to as many as possible. Um, I challenged myself to put together a workshop panel for a con. I was like, there's no way I'm going to talk in front of a bunch of people. Like, there's just no way it's going to happen. Um, and I put together the beginner DM was a workshop slash panel for Stanley Comic Con last year. And it was 10 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. We had like 40 people come. So that showed me that people are maybe interested in the tactics of like, you know, maybe dungeon mastering or GMing, but maybe they're just a bunch of gamers who want to see what else is happening out in the world in the space that they love. Um, and I challenged myself to do that, something I'm uncomfortable with, and get up, put my bravery hat on, let's try something new. Get out to your game shop and meet new people. Go into, you know, uh, or ask the game shop if they can connect different communities that aren't often connected. You know, there are people, I, I live in LA, which is a big city and a big state, and I still realize that there are some spaces where I have not made the connections that I'd like to in the gaming world. And I need to reach out to advocates in those spaces and go, I, how can I get you? How can I be in your space? And how can you be in my space? How can we do this? And that connection, Dave, I think you really, that epiphany I think is super important. And I feel like it's one of the things that would help us get to, you know, um, um, an even stronger, more beautiful culture is connection is key. Right? Connection is going to be key. Finding a bunch of different and, and, and exposing yourself and connecting with all different types of games and storytelling people, I think is what's gonna, I think that'll make our community sort of rise above. I'm a little bit partial to the gaming community than say to the video gaming community. <laughs> um, well, I think and, it's I, and I feel like I wanna challenge our particular, you know, community to go, I know, I, I, I know we falter and we misstep, but I know we are um, challenging ourselves to do better every day, every day, every day. I think it's an overall all better community, and the reason for that is so much direct interaction where video games are – you you they I feel like the – people are directly interacting with the game and then indirectly interacting with each other. No yes. matter what medium we use when we tabletop, we directly interact with each other. I know we have, uh, there's lots of people in our gaming space that are, uh, you know, they're dealing with their own issues in life right now. They don't necessarily want to reach out to other people and that's fine. You know, first step would be like this, 
watch other gamers and geeks talking to each other and engaging in this way in a very safe space. And, and those of us who are in gaming leadership and business or in creativity and creative spaces, let's make more safe spaces for people, you know, who maybe feels feeling some kind of way to be able to talk. But one thing I would like to put a challenge forth, um, because I saw this on, on a post on social uh, in our gaming spaces one day, which is, I would like to see us not do um, if it's not in my experience, then therefore it doesn't exist, or therefore it's not as valid. And that's very disappointing. I was like, I can't believe I'm reading this, and that someone feels like that their limited experience is a great foundational evidence for the vast human experiences that we have as people in this world, with whatever you're going through in your life, and as gamers. Because I didn't see it, and I didn't experience it, therefore it must not happen, or must not be true. I, that I would say 100%, let's not do that to each other anymore. I've, all experiences are valid, and I personally want to hear all your stories of gaming, whether they're silly and you come up with a pig dude, a pig ninja, or they're profound where you've created a story that helps someone you know, um, heal through a death of someone that they love. Like This is what I would like to hear, and not that because I didn't see it, therefore it didn't happen or it doesn't exist. I don't want us to, just, I don't want us to do that anymore. That's my challenge. Auntie TL said so. We need to get there, and absolutely, because you, you're right. You see it all the time, and like you know, I oftentimes will kind of go into the, you know, my experience growing up, uh, and especially when I get a female gamer on. I like that. I like to ask about it because my experience was different, and like we never really had many female gamers to game with. It, it wasn't a thing, and I could definitely see like I could easily say, "Well, I didn't see that," right? Because I know exactly where you're coming from with those comments, and I didn't see it because there was no female gamers to really see it with. But, you know, it's not an excuse to disqualify someone else's experience. Yeah, just that's the key. I, I think that it's beautiful to have someone to go, you know, in my experience, it, it's not, I didn't see a lot of female gamers or people of color, disabled gamers, or or uh, definitely different types of uh, ethnicities and races represented, you know, at, at the table where I was at. Um, is that your experience? Or, you know, can I find some more information? I remember reading something about a post on Wonder Woman. Somebody said very snarkily, which is what they do, would have been great to see some Asian Amazons. And then, like, the very next post was, oops, there actually was Asian Amazons, like in Wonder Woman, right? So, yeah, just because you didn't see it or maybe you it didn't fall onto your radar, let's start there before you make that next general assumption, which was, which is, therefore, it must not exist. That That if is great. If I don't see it, then... Let me ask questions as opposed to if I don't see it, then, well, it must not happen. So, uh, no, I'm a female gamer, and if I'm the only one you know, congratulations. Your entire, you know, worldview has now changed, but I'm not the only one for sure. I'm not the only Spanish gamer. I'm not the only Latino gamer, Hispanic gamer. Um, you know, I'm not the only woman of a certain age gamer. I'm 40. Right? I'm not the only one. I've worked with them. I meet them. Um, they're making business decisions on the on on, on products all the time, um, and I think that's where I'd like to be. Is that let's go with if I don't see it, well, where can I find it, and where can I reach out to my other people, and how can I make those connections? The um the really cool thing about that that game I mentioned, uh, the Star Wars game that's coming up. You know, we we have like my son that's sixteen, and then you know there's a bunch of us that are like in our forties, uh, early forties, mid forties, and late. Uh, and then, you know, and then we have some guys that are in, you know, thirties and, and even their twenties. And then we have a couple of ladies playing with us and our table has never looked like this <laughs> before in, you know, in the 20 years. Yeah. But and that's so good. A milestone. <laughs> I, I think that's a, that's a thing. And that is the wonderful, I think just change. I don't even say evolution. It's not about evolving to something completely different. It's just a natural change of things as people reach out and want to be more a part of this, what I feel is a spectacular community of, of creative folks uh, and smart folks in this space, right? That idea that there are lots of different types of people and where can I find these people? And maybe you'll see they will just naturally be there. And then another challenge I would put, and I see that falls with us as leaders in this community is, when we see these changes happening, let's embrace this and let's invite people, come on in, come sit down, come play a game, come try something new, come experience this thing. And at least if you've never experienced it before or you will never experience it again, that one moment that you have had is a moment where we've made that connection and a positive connection. Yeah, so I think that's a perfect note to end on. 
and you know basically just grow the community and you know love gaming and love the people you're gaming with pretty much it's it's awesome thanks everyone for hanging out tl thanks for coming on i really appreciate it uh i knew it was going to be fun but it was even better than i thought and with that guys until next time stay nerdy <laughs>